that the prototypic figure for the artist, as well as for the scientist, is the shaman. The shaman is the figure at the beginning of human history that unites the doctor, the scientist, and the artist into a single notion of caregiving and creativity. Caregiving and creativity. I think that, you know, to whatever degree art over the past several centuries has wandered in the desert, it is because this shamanic function has been either suppressed or forgotten. And we've, uh, different images of the artist have been held up at different times. The artist as artisan, the artist as handmaiden of a ruling class or family, the artist as designer for the production of integrated objects into a civilization. This notion of the artist as mystical journeyer, as one who goes into a world unseen by others and then returns to tell them of it, was pretty much lost in the post-medieval uh, and Renaissance conception of art up until the late 19th century or early 20th century, where, beginning with the Romantics, there is a new permission to explore the irrational. There is a new permission to explore the irrational. This really is the bridge back to the archaic shamanic function of the artist permission to explore the irrational. The Romantics did it with their um, elevation of titanic emotion, of romantic love specifically. The symbolists in the mid-19th century did it by a re-emphasis on the emotional content of the image and a rejection of the previous rationalism. And that emphasis on the image and on the emotions set the stage then for what I take to be the, the truly shamanic movements in art, which begin really with Alfred Jarry in the late 1880s and early 1890s. Jarry, you may remember, was the founder of something called the Ecole du Pathétique, the Pathophysical College. Jari announced, pataphysics is the science. The problem was nobody could understand what it meant or what it stood for, including Jari. <laughs> See, this was a true effort to bend the boundaries of art, to create new permission, permission really for the unthinkable. And this, uh, again, reinforces the shamanic function what do we mean when we say the unthinkable? We mean the envelope of that which can be conceived. And for uh, at least 200 years, the ostensible mission of the artist has been to test the conceptual and imagistic envelope of what the society is willing to tolerate. And this has taken many forms the uh, deconstruction of imagery that we get with abstract expressionism going back into impressionism and the point of it, or uh, the permission for the irrational imagery of the unconscious surrealism and, uh, and German expressionism to make use of this permission. Always the idea of being to somehow destroy the idols of the tribe. Dissolve the conceptual boundary of ordinary expectation. Well, in order to do this, it seems to me there is a precondition for the creation of art, 
which I call understanding. And I don't mean this in an intellectual sense. I mean it in the sense that Alfred North Whitehead intended when he defined understanding as the apperception of pattern as such. As such. There's nothing more to it than that. You see, if we were to look at this room and we were to squint our eyes and uh, I'm doing this right now and I see that the room divides itself into people dressed in red and people dressed in blue. This is a pattern and it tells me something about what I'm looking at. Now I shift my depth of field. Now I'm looking at where men are sitting and where women are sitting. This is a different pattern and it tells me more about what I am looking at. The number of these patterns theoretically present in any construction is infinite. That says to me then that the depth of understanding cannot be known. It cannot be known. Everything is imminent. William Blake makes this point, you know, that you can see infinity in a grain of sand. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. A robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. A dove house filled with doves and pigeons shudders hell through all its regions. A dog starved at his master's gate predicts the ruin of the state. A horse misused upon the road calls to heaven for human blood. Each outcry of the hunted hare a fiber from the brain does tear. A skylark wounded in the wing, a cherubim does cease to sing. The gamecock, clipped and armed for fight, does the rising sun affright. Every wolf's and lion's howl raises from hell a human soul. The wild deer, wandering here and there, keeps the human soul from here. The lamb, misused, breeds public strife, and yet forgives the butcher's knife. The bat that flits at close of eve has left the brain that won't believe. The owl that calls upon the night speaks the unbeliever's fright. He who shall hurt the little wren shall never be beloved by men. He who the ox to wrath has moved shall never be by woman loved. The wanton boy that kills the fly shall feel the spider's enmity. He who torments the chafer sprite weaves a bower in endless night. The caterpillar on the leaf repeats to thee thy mother's grief. Kill not the moth nor butterfly, for the last judgment draweth nigh. He who shall train the horse to war shall never pass the polar bar. The beggar's dog and widow's cat feed them and thou wilt grow fat. The gnat that sings his summer's song poison gets from slander's tongue. The poison of the snake and newt is the sweat of envy's foot. The poison of the honeybee is the artist's jealousy. The prince's robes and beggar's rags are toadstools on the miser's bags. A truth that's told with bad intent beats all the lies you can invent. It is right it should be so. Man was made for joy and woe. And when this we rightly know, through the world we safely go. Joy and woe are woven fine, a clothing for the soul divine. Under every grief and pine runs a joy with silken twine. The babe is more than swaddling bands. Throughout all these human lands, tools were made and born were hands. Every farmer understands. Every tear from every eye becomes a babe in eternity. This is caught by females bright and returned to its own delight. The bleat, the bark, bellow and roar 
are waves that beat on heaven's shore. The babe that weeps the rod beneath writes revenge in realms of death. The beggar's rags fluttering in air does to rags the heavens tear. The soldier armed with sword and gun calls it strikes the summer's sun. The poor man's farthing is worth more than all the gold on Africa's shore. One mite wrung from the laborer's hands shall buy and sell the miser's lands. Or if protected from on high, does that whole nation sell and buy? He who mocks the infant's faith shall be mocked in age and death. He who shall teach the child to doubt the rotting grave shall ne'er get out. He who respects the infant's faith triumphs over hell and death. The child's toys and the old man's reasons are the fruits of the two seasons. The questioner who sits so sly shall never know how to reply. He who replies to words of doubt doth put the light of knowledge out. The strongest poison ever known came from Caesar's laurel crown. Naught can deform the human race like the armor's iron brace. When gold and gems adorn the plough, to peaceful arts shall envy bow. A riddle or the cricket's cry is to doubt a fit reply. The emmet's inch and eagle's mile make lame philosophy to smile. He who doubts from what he sees will ne'er believe do what you please. If the sun and moon should doubt, they'd immediately go out. To be in a passion you good may do, but no good if a passion is in you. The whore and gambler by the state licensed build that nation's fate. The harlot's cry from street to street shall weave old England's winding sheet. The winner's shout, the loser's curse, dance before dead England's hearse. Every night and every morn, some to misery are born. Every morn and every night, some are born to sweet delight. Some are born to sweet delight, some are born to endless night. We are led to believe a lie when we see not through the eye which was born in a night to perish in a night when the soul slipped in beams of light. God appears and God is light to those poor souls who dwell in night. But does a human form display to those who dwell in realms of day. So understanding then is the, pre, the precondition for creativity. And this understanding is not so much intellectual as it is visual, visual.